Good morning. Thanks very much, Leroy. And thanks to Joe as well. Uh, and welcome to, to the conference. Um, I'd like to thank the institution for inviting me back uh, to speak at this, uh, this event. It's, it, as uh, Leroy said, it holds a special place for me as I was here as a speaker 17 years ago talking about my PhD. And it was really, I think, the recognition that my research got through this event played a, a key role in the impact that it had and also set my career on a path, really, where the, uh, looking at research and how that research can be incorporated into standards uh, and therefore influence the work that we do in the industry uh, has played a really key strand uh, in my career over the past nearly 20 years. And uh, that's really one of the themes that I want to talk about today. Um, it is clear what happens when we get it wrong. And this is a picture of the bridge in Genoa, which collapsed recently, and many of you will be, will be aware of that. Um, and of course, when that was built, it was heralded as a triumph of innovation. Um, but there are many challenges involved in managing uh, the structure, and there are many challenges in all of our existing structures in terms of how we manage them and in understanding how safe they are. This is a key kind of topic for me. Um, and what I'd like to talk about is really why research matters and why we do it. And uh, there has to be a clear benefit or outcome. The impact from it has to drive why we're doing it. And um, for me, I've particularly been looking at existing structures um, and how we can more accurately assess them and manage them uh, more appropriately and avoid the sort of tragedies that we've seen recently in Genoa and before that in Florida, in Montreal, in Minnesota, among others. So I'm from the, the bridges side of things, so I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be talking a bit about bridges today. Um, but for me, if we can do research that actually has a real impact, a real direct impact on our industry, then that's, that's very important. Um, in WSP, where I'm a technical director, um, we have embedded in our approach to projects this concept of being future ready. And this is really about making sure that we're not just designing for today, but adapting our work to incorporate a whole range of future trends. Um, and in this way, our structures can be more resilient, adaptable, capable of withstanding changes in climate or changes in the way that we expect people to be living in the future and ready for, ready for changes in technology and a whole range of other trends. Um, and it's research that really plays a key role in how we can do that effectively. And... Um, And uh, the other thing that we've gotten there is engineers like to learn and we like to solve problems. And that's one of the key reasons that a lot of us do, do research. Uh, I've got a picture here of um, Gordon Glegg, who in the 1930s had a real passion for messing around with racing cars. He, he was a, an inventor, an engineer, and a racing driver as well, and became a bit of a celebrity. Uh, he was my granddad, so I think that a lot of the passion that he had for that sort of engineering, and that led him into re doing engineering research over a whole range of different, um, different areas of engineering. And I think that had a big impact on me in terms of why I chose to do, to focus on the combination of research and uh, practice. And we like solving problems, as I said. Um, and sometimes the solutions to problems are not as obvious as, as they might seem. But for me, there has to be a direct application of, of the solution. And uh, there's lots and lots of research going on. And recently, there was the discovery of the Higgs boson particle, which was a major breakthrough in particle physics, one that was quite emotional for the researchers that were, they devoted their careers to, to finding it. Um, and the impact of that research is yet to be seen. Um, you might not understand what the impact of that is for decades to come. Whereas in structures, we have the opportunity to directly influence 
the world by carrying out research that improves safety and resilience, saves significant costs, and the mechanism for this is through the updates and standards. And this is something which, um, as Leroy said, I'm very involved in at the moment in, in how we can update the standards to incorporate these improvements and these updates. An example of this is the one that I spoke about when I was here 17 years ago. And you can see how long ago it is, because the branding of the Waitrose lorry is clearly way out of date. Um, but you can see there a, a bridge which is over the M4. Um, and at the start of my career, I was involved in the assessment of 30 bridges that looked like this. The whole family of bridges, all, all with very similar designs. And they all had the same problem, the same theoretical deficiency. And it was to do with the reinforcement of the support and how that was detailed. Uh, it did not extend beyond the support, um, which, of course, if we're designing new structures now, we would have to make sure that it was properly anchored. Um, when you look at older structures, they don't always behave the rules that we need to apply in design. Um, and when, at the time, the assessment code that was in, in place at the time, which was BD 4495, um, it said that these structures shouldn't be standing, which clearly was wrong because they were fine. So what we persuaded the Highways Agency at the time, now Highways England, uh, to pay for some laboratory testing at the University of Bath. And um, so we, we, we cast some, some specimens that were identical to the elements um, uh, that where this deficiency was. Uh, and and they, these were actually the run-on spans to these structures which uh, actually acted as additional spans. Um, and you can see there that the reinforcement just stops at the support. Uh, so we did some testing to see how they really behaved at ULS and did a comparison of how, how that with, with the uh, predictions of the code. And uh, at the time, the code said that the capacity of these elements was predicted to be less than 50 kilonewtons. And... Um, if we could show that these specimens had about 100 kilonewtons, then th these 30 bridges would be able to resist the full assessment loading with all the factors on it. And in reality, the resistance was way up to 200, between 130 and 200 kilonewtons. So we showed that the true strength was about three to five times higher than what the code was saying. So there was a clear, there was a clear issue here, which was... And it was, I was agency were very, very pleased with that result. Um, but as a result of that, we then said, well, hang on, we need to look into this in more detail and see if we can update the standards. Um, we saved about £3 million at the time just on those bridges because we didn't have to strengthen them. We didn't, there was no disruption. Um, we could extend the life of the structures. But the question remained, could we do it? Could we apply it to other structures? Could the impact from these tests be rolled out across the whole industry? And that was where my PhD came in, and I did 84 tests of various different types of beams and slabs, looking at this issue in much more detail, and looked at various different analytical methods, and, um, and developed a new proposal for the, for the standard. So this is an example setup. You can, again, you can see, because it's a beige computer, how, how long ago it was don't have beige computers anymore. Um, the, um, when you compare the results, and you can see the sorts of failures, the sorts of failures that I was getting, uh, you compare the results with what the code predicted, you can see that really there wasn't much of a trend and it was very conservative. Um, and then by developing this new proposal for the standard, you had a much better correlation between the, uh, the, the theory and the actual results. So eventually this method was included in the next iteration of the standard. It did take them quite a while to do, but uh, 2015 it appeared in the, in the code. Um, and in the meantime, the development of standards has become a key part of, of what I do in my, in my role at WSP. At the moment, I'm working with Highways England on the major update of the whole of the 
DMRB, which is their suite of standards, uh, including this one uh, for assessment. Uh, this is obviously a major operation. They're, they're updating over 300 standards all at the same time to be consistent and easier to use um, and more concise. Um, and I've been tasked with rewriting many of the standards, including this one. Um, it's, and it's going to be more focused on, on, on their requirements. Um, at the same time, I've also become heavily involved in the, the development of the second generation of the Eurocodes for structural design for new structures. Um, it was in 2010 that the, the first generation was finally implemented in the UK after decades of, of work on it across Europe. And the picture shows the, the Red Haze Bridge that we, we designed, um, which was the first bridge in the UK to be designed and constructed to the full suite of Eurocodes. Um, we're now developing the first major update uh, to that whole suite of standards. Um, so there's a whole load of investment currently happening at the moment. So the whole suite of Eurocode standards, the whole suite of DMRP standards for highways and bridges, all being updated um, at the moment. Uh, the Eurocodes are used by around half a million engineers, so that's quite an impact. Um, it's the, the construction sector is wor in Europe worth around 65 billion euros. Um, we currently have 10 Euro, 10 Euro codes in 59 parts, uh, about 5,000 pages long. There are over 1,000 nationally determined parameters, and so you need to consult a lot of national annexes. Uh, to get the values to be used in the UK. Um, 33 countries involved in their development um, and there are uh, nearly 100 different subcommittees responsible for these documents, including the working groups and the task groups. Um, there's a lot of money has been invested. The first phase of the second generation of Eurocodes was 4.5 million euros, um, the total 11.5 million euros, which is the biggest funding pot ever awarded by the uh, European Commission for the uh, development of standards by far. Um, we have 76 different project teams working on the second generation. I'm on three of them, so one on concrete and two on developing future Eurocodes for assessment of existing structures. Um, and so we have a whole load of these project teams in the different phases. It's just a huge amount of work, and by 2021, we expect this, this work to be complete, and shortly after that, there'll be a further process before you'll start to see these documents uh, appearing. So these are the two areas that I'm involved in, which is concrete and existing structures. So we have created a bit of a monster here. You can see that it's a very kind of complex system of standards, lots and lots of documents, lots of pages, lots of, lots of different interactions between different documents. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do is just make them easier to use. And uh, engineers always tend to be quite resistant to new codes being introduced. Um, there's some comments up on the screen here from the structural engineer um, on the left from the early 70s. And then very similar comments in 1997 when the code that they were complaining about in the 70s was, was updated uh, again. Um, and we have a quote here, like, like life in general, our code seems to be getting more and more complicated. And I think there's a lot of resistance to, to that sort of progression. And there's a general feeling that it would be better to simplify them. So let's go back in history to 1750 BC, Mesopotamia, and the, the Babylonian king Hammurabi. One of his laws relates to the design and construction of buildings. If a designer builder has designed, built a home for a man and his work is not good enough, and if the house he has designed, built falls in and kills the householder, we well, can guess what happens. Design and builder should be slain. So even back in 1750 BC, they were using a pain gain share contract. And it's quite an incentive to get your design right. But no actual calculation models, of course, to help you. 
Then Vitruvius introduced some principles of good structural design, firmitas, utilitas, venustas, in the first century BC. And I guess these correspond loosely to our concepts of ULS, SLS, aesthetics, that we often think about now. But again, still no maths, no theories to, to back them up. And it wasn't until fairly recently that standards to enable structures to be designed using mathematical models were developed. And over the last century, the complexity and the volume of these standards has really taken off. <coughs> so in the second generation of Eurocodes, the aim is to reduce the complexity and improve ease of use. And the impact of doing that is huge. I mean, how often can we say in our work that the work that we do directly affects what half a million people do in their jobs? I mean, it's quite a huge impact it, making these improvements to standards. It has a huge effect directly on what the industry does. Um, is important in terms of international trade, reducing barriers to trade across Europe. Um, and obviously, verification of adequacy. If we don't get this right, then our structures are not safe. There's also a mechanism for feedback. So there's a huge amount of people using these documents, and we have a staged process of publication so that we can get feedback early on, and then we can improve them before they come to the kind of mandatory stage. So it's a mechanism for incorporating new societal demands and also for your research to be directly applied. And not just your research, but the research of all of the researchers who are using Eurocodes across Europe. So enhancing the ease of use is what is one of the two key drivers for this, this second generation uh, that will be coming up soon. Uh, the other one is about exemplary levels of international consensus. So the aim is for the second generation to be a more user-orientated user suite of design standards that are recognized as the most trusted and preferred in the world. So William Gibson was a novelist. He, he coined the term cyberspace, and he had this idea that if you want an idea of what the future looks like, look at the pockets of innovation which have not yet become widely adopted and imagine a future where those things have become common. So I've largely been talking about what's happened in the last 20 years. But if we now think about the next 20 years, we are now currently living in a time of some game-changing advances in technology and automation. And over the next 20 years, how are we going to be designing our structures? How will our world be different? And this is something we're currently working with Highways England to develop some tools that will move our standards forward into the digital age and into a more adaptable, collaborative, agile model where our standards can be kept up to date more easily and where the form of the requirements can be fed into other applications to enable more efficient applications. So we don't think in the future everyone was, is just going to be having paper standards that they've just printed off from a PDF. It's going to be much more connected. It's going to be much easier to quickly keep the standards up to date for them to be applied by other applications to feed into automation, to feed into more adaptable processes that will help us to be future ready. And High Res England has their digital roads vision and the work that we are doing with them on, on this technical standards enterprise system is, is really key to that. It has the potential to bring together all of the different advances of technology, enable a much more efficient way of delivering all the various aspects of its design, construction, operate model. And you can see 
the, the, the tools that we are working on at the moment are really at the heart of this. And instead of removing the need for engineers, uh, this vision will, will free us up to, to focus more on the, more, the most valuable aspects of design uh, that will enhance the customer value. Um, because, I mean, as, as Joe talked about earlier with the, the parabola being inverted, um, often we spend a lot of our time doing repetitive tasks, which could be automated. Um, if we can make that change, we can focus more of our time on solving the problems that we can really add value to as, as really um, professional engineers. <clears throat> and we do like to solve problems. So which one's the odd one out then? Does anyone know? Show of hands, who thinks it's the one on the left? Next one along, the circle, the blue square, nobody, or the little square, some for the little square. All of them? Well, I'll tell you the answer. The answer is actually the one on the left. And the reason for that is that all of the other ones have something unique about them. The one on the left is red, that's not unique. It's got a size that's not unique. It's got a black border, that's not unique. All the others, have, all the others are an odd one out. So the odd one out is the only one that's not an odd one out. <laughs> There's nothing unique about it, but it's a pleasingly subversive question, uh, odd one out question. Um, and as engineers, we need to be looking for the unexpected solutions, not just relying on what we've done in the past, not relying on the trends of the past. Uh, we need to be predicting the trends of the future. So I ask you, what, how will your research have an impact on the way we live in the future, in 20 years' time or more? And how will it have an impact on the way that we design and manage our structures? I can't wait to find out. Thank you very much. <laughs>